We welcome our first keynote speaker, author John Gerda. John is a Milwaukee-born writer and historian who has been studying his hometown since 1972. He is the author of 21 books, including histories of Milwaukee, area neighborhoods, industries, and places of worship. The Making of Milwaukee is his most ambitious effort. With 450 pages and more than 500 illustrations, it is the first full-length history of the community published since 1948. He served as scriptwriter and hosted the Emmy Award-winning documentary series based on the book in 2006, Milwaukee, City of Neighborhoods, a richly illustrated geographic companion to the general history, followed in 2015. I'd also like to recognize our fellow WLA member, COVID support provided the cartography for this book. In addition to his work as an author, he's a lecturer, tour guide, and local district columnist for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. His undergraduate degree is a BA in English from Boston College, and he holds an MA in cultural geography and an honorary PhD from the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. The common thread in all of John Gerda's work is an understanding of history as why things are the way they are. Please join me in welcoming John Gerda. Of law, but by virtue of our shared perceptions. 
What I want to do this morning is take a look at Milwaukee's evolution as a city of neighborhoods, both as a case study of uh, larger geographic themes and to give you some spatial insight into Wisconsin's largest city. What's interesting is that the earliest map I can find of Milwaukee neighborhoods is this one dating back to 1970. This is the Urban Observatory, part of WM. For generations, people in Milwaukee have been aware of neighborhoods like they view in the Third Ward and Layton Park, but they were just part of the civic furniture. Unremarkable and unremarked. It was not until the 1960s when so much else changed in American culture that people began to appreciate the small scale, the grandeur, the grassroots perspective that neighborhoods embody. They emerged from obscurity to become focal points of planning, community organizing, celebration, and concern. So those maps continue to evolve. You'll notice that the Urban Observatory map is basically an aggregation of census tracts. They were not drawing natural, natural lines, that they were simply for point of convenience kind of aggregating chunks of census tracts to uh, give them some kind of identity beyond the track level. But things continued to evolve back in the early 1980s. I was part of a program uh, sponsored by the city of Milwaukee called the Neighborhood Recognition Project. And we began, first of all, by dividing the city into sides. And Milwaukee, like many cities, is a city of sides. And this exercise proved to be a good deal more difficult than you might realize. We use railroads, obviously, rivers, obviously, uh, at least section lines, and also using ISO lines showing the age of, age of housing in the area, you kind of divide it up. But again, just like neighborhoods, you will not find consensus about where these lines should be properly drawn. So we had the outline, and we also did neighborhoods themselves. A woman named Janet Katoas, wonderful artist, uh, did 27 posters featuring some kind of architectural uh, landmark in the Milwaukee neighborhoods. And I wrote on the backs of each of these posters an essay describing the history and culture and housing in each area, which means if the posters got hung, that those words went away forever. <laughs> on the back of a posted stamp. So that was the first effort. And there were others that followed Here's a rather intuitive look at Milwaukee neighborhoods little, by a little later cartographer. And I like this as kind of an honest approach to mapping neighborhoods. You'll notice that they look at neighborhoods not as these hard and fast borders, but more as spheres of influence, which in fact is how they operate. You know, there's kind of uh, hearts of neighborhoods and the borders are somewhat changeable. Uh, and you'll also notice that the size is here is almost like orders of magnitude of the star. That's true as well. You know, some have richer identities, a stronger sense of place than others. And this map recognizes that. So that's on the soft side. Uh, the other end of the scale, back in the late 1980s, the city of Milwaukee decided that they would give every square inch of the city a name in a neighborhood. So it ended up with roughly 200 neighborhoods in Milwaukee. Some named after subdivisions, some named after parks, some kind of pulled out of the air, including my favorite, Clock Tower Acres, which is a small neighborhood just east of the Allen Bradley or Rockwell Automation Clock. So to their surprise, people who live in that neighborhood woke up one morning to find that they were residents of Clock Tower Acres. <laughs> you know, it had never existed on uh, the map before. And then things went on, and about four or five years ago, I approached a group called Historic Milwaukee Incorporated. And part of it was frustration of all that hard won information from that poster series going to waste. So the result was a book called Milwaukee City of Neighborhoods that took those first 27 neighborhoods that each had a poster. We added 10 more and new images and new text as well. Updated the text of the old ones that was in some cases 30 years old and ended up with a book that describes 37 of Milwaukee's neighborhoods in the older part of town. You'll notice we kept the sides, the north, south, east, west, as well as central, uh, but also inside those sides, identified neighborhoods. And if it didn't make sense, we didn't commit to everything, if it didn't make sense, the neighborhood was too minuscule or too, uh, too kind of vaporized in some sense, the spots on the land map remain blank. So what I wanna do this morning is talk about Milwaukee, the city of neighborhoods. How did this happen? 
and uh, understand that, now we move to the intersection of time and place, which is historical geography, and it's where I've lived for more than 40 years. So you look back at the early years of Milwaukee, we began because of the rivers as a city of three sides, the east side founded by a uh, French Canadian fur trader named Solomon Juno, the west side founded by Mr. Sunshine, Byron Kilborn. <laughs> We are in, any of you know the old name of Wisconsin Dells? Kilbourn City. This is where the railroad crossed, his railroad crossed, which is why that name is still, you see it's some of the place names around here in Wisconsin Dells. And on the south side, a man named George Walker, who was a genial son of Virginia, who founded Walker's Point. So you have those three guys who didn't get along especially well. Settlement begins back in 1835, and I can't see the screen, so I can't point to it, but you have Walker's Point down there in the south part, uh, the lower part of the photograph, or the slide, and you've got Juno on the east side, Kilbourne on the west side, and those three were uh, rather serious competitors. You have Byron Kilbourne, who like, was without doubt the most aggressive of those competitors, Walker was both temperamentally, uh, politically, and financially kind of disqualified, <laughs> kind of a distant third in that three-way race. So the, the contest was between Kilborn and Juno. This is a map published by Byron Kilborn back in 1836. What's missing? <laughs> there is no east side. The east side is a complete blank, but he left every single lot for sale on his side, and this was propaganda, basically. He was trying to tell people that settlement and investment should be done in his side of the Milwaukee River. So after some spirited resistance from the west side, or the east side succeeded back in 1840 in building one bridge across the Milwaukee River. The west side had suffered silence for a few years, and then one warm night in the summer of 1845, reasoning that what touched their side was theirs to do with it as they wished. They took axes and hatchets and liberated that span, slapped it into the Milwaukee River, blocking traffic going north. Uh, the east side would wake up in the morning to find that they can't go anywhere to the west, so they retaliate by cutting off the west side bridges to the south. So a little like Friday Night Lights, Friday Night Football. <laughs> so for a while, no one could get anywhere in downtown Milwaukee. And they finally re realized they were scaring people away. So 1846, then that day of January, all three sides, Walker's Point, part of the party now, uh, decide to form joint forces as the city of Milwaukee. As the first city in Wisconsin, two years before Wisconsin became a state, it's still a territory. So there, back in those days, there are some, I talk about histories, why things are the way they are. Things last a very long time. Before there were bridges, there was no need for the east and west sides to have systems, street systems that join. So you have Kilborn going his own way, as was often the case, when they finally built bridges, they joined at an angle. That was the case back in the 1840s, and is still the case today. Those Broadway intersections, Broadway crossings are part of the fabric of downtown Milwaukee, and will remain so until the end of urban time. Imagine what it would cost to rationalize that system. So Milwaukee became a city of sides, and I'll describe them uh, briefly, one by one. It helps to think uh, the history of most American cities, most world cities, as a result of a very slow and extended Big Bang. You begin with a burst of energy and some nucleus of settlement. It moves out, in our case, Milwaukee's case, every direction but east because of the lake. And as the city grows, it kind of takes with it the DNA of areas that are closer to the heart of town. So you have kind of an imprint that moves from the heart out to the edges. And that's certainly true in neighbors like the east side. This is a neighborhood that is only four square miles, or a district that's only four square miles, and that's 4% of Milwaukee's land area. It plays kind of an outsized role in Milwaukee's culture and its geography. The dominant pattern here is a contrast between wealth on the lake and working class settlement on the river. And that's embodied in all the neighborhoods that, that developed as the east side grew. Again, with the Lower East Side, this is the Oriental Theater, on uh, the Farwell and North Avenue. And one of the really nice things about the City Neighborhoods book is the cartography done by Colter Sikora. I'm gonna wave your, wave your arm there, Colter. One of your younger members works for the PSC, and Jan Katoa, the artist for the poster series, uh, said that these maps are artworks in themselves. 
and just represent a great deal of work and certainly a high degree of craftsmanship as well. So each one of the chapters uh, has a map by Poulter describing not just the infrastructure, the various layers on the landscape, but also points of interest. So you begin the east side's history on a neighborhood called Yankee Hill, which is the area kind of northeast of downtown, or north, northeast side of downtown. That's where the Yankees lived, and that was a rather elastic term, meaning largely some of the Anglo-Saxon background born east of Chicago. You guys can't see me. You're, you're welcome to come over here. <laughs> you can join us if you, if you wish. I uh, can look at it. Your peripheral vision must be good if you're kind of picking up the images here, but feel free to look, look if you like. And these were all the churches that they uh, established were all the Anglo-American faiths, Presbyterian, uh, Methodist, Episcopalian, Unitarian. Uh, one thing you did not, the people you did not see in Yankee Hill, there were no Catholics, no Lutherans, no Jews. Those were the immigrants, and they were someplace else. To this day, Yankee Hill has one of the most distinguished skylines in the Midwest in terms of its 19th century church building. As time went on, those wealthy families moved up the lakeshore, attracted by the prospect or view of Lake Michigan, Prospect Avenue, became kind of like summits in St. Paul or Euclid in Cleveland, kind of a King's Road. This was sort of the Gold Coast of Milwaukee's east side. And this was something that lasted for a couple of generations. They would commute back to buildings downtown where they worked like Northwestern Mutual. Uh, but they lived in a rather different sphere from those who lived over on the river. And what was going on there goes back to the 1840s when Byron Kilborn built a dam across the river just south of North Avenue. Not this one. This, they weren't doing photography with people at the first dam back in 1843. But it was intended as a source of a reliable head for a canal that would have linked his west side was the Rock River at Atkinson, and ultimately the Mississippi is where he was headed. So he envisioned this as kind of the Erie Canal of Wisconsin. Didn't happen, he had a habit of making enemies, and the state pulled the plug on his canal when he only had a mile and a quarter done. So the Kilbourne Canal became a stillborn canal. But he always had a plan B, and because you had that dependable source of water power, this became Milwaukee's first industrial district. So you have, by the 1860s, you have flour mills, sawmills, textile mills, in time, tanneries like Pfister and Vogel. And this became long before there was a Menominee Valley as an industrial center. This became Milwaukee's manufacturing powerhouse. So you have all those workers, all those jobs being, uh, being available in those riverfront industries. And that attracted one of Milwaukee's largest ethnic groups, and that was the Poles. A lot of them were on the south side, as you'll see, but they were on the east side as well. And there was actually open land between the Polish settlement on Brady Street and downtown. They moved out to Brady Street because they could be close to work, walking to work at the riverfront industries. This is a former ravine, now it's called Pulaski Street. On uh, the left side of the slide is Wolski's Tavern. How many of you have closed Wolski's? <laughs> <laughs> Bumper sticker in Milwaukee and around Wisconsin is I close Wolski's, and that's certainly uh, a drinking landmark in Milwaukee. They were very heavily Catholic, and St. Hedwig's Church was built back in 1871 as the second Polish church in Milwaukee. They had their own business establishments, and this is again kind of an urban village out there on the edge of Milwaukee. And they had the, what were by modern standards painfully small homes. Uh, sometimes they were described as Polish flats, beginning as a single story cottage. In time, you raised it off its foundation with heavy jacks, built a second living unit beneath it, and had what the building inspectors call an English basement duplex. Washington's called them Polish flats and incredible density. So you have that rather remarkable contrast between the wealth on the lakeside and the working class settlement on the riverside. Tiny houses, chickens in the backyard, the bells of St. Hedwig's keeping time for the neighborhood. A few blocks away above the lake, you have the splendor of Victoria mansions with kids who went off to Europe on the grand tour when they got out of high school. Domestic staffs, and they shared the same neighborhood. They were uh, only, in some cases, two or three blocks apart. But that contrast defined the east side and persisted as the city continued to grow. 
In about the 1880s, the wealthy families from Prospect made a hard right turn on Lafayette Avenue, a settled neighborhood called North Point, and found some landmarks waiting for them, among that the North Point Water Tower, and that was built back in 1873 to house a cast iron standpipe that was built to relieve pressure from the pulsations of the reciprocating pumps in Milwaukee's first pumping works, going back to 1873. Right across the street, was St. Mary's Hospital, Wisconsin's first public hospital. And it moved out there back in 1858, uh, not because they wanted the view, but because they were not welcome in the heart of town. Back in those days, hospitals were where you went to die. So there was a committee that was formed with a petition to remove what they called the seat of pestilence from the heart of downtown out to the edge. And this was the edge back in 1858. In time, the wealthy families followed them up there. Terrace Avenue overlooking the lake became kind of a latter-day extension of Prospect Avenue. This is the home of Gustav Pabst and his wife Hilda, and I'll show you where they moved from on the west side a little bit. This is the front yard. Here's the backyard. And these lots would cascade down to uh, the lakefront where Lincoln Memorial Drive is today. And it probably didn't happen. I cherish the image of Gus Taft out there with his U-neck t-shirt with a glass of beer in his hand mowing the lawn. He, he probably had people doing that for him. Right next door to Gus and Hilda was the home of Lloyd Raymond Smith, whose father was Arthur Oliver Smith, A.O. Smith, who had the world's largest manufacturer of car and automobile, car and truck frames. And this is a faithful replica of a Mediterranean villa and when she died, this was willed to the people of Milwaukee and been maintained ever since as a decorative arts museum. So this is the only one of those North Point mansions where you can get in and see what the wealthy used to look like. And back a little bit farther north, uh, the Upper East Side is the area above North Avenue. And that was kind of, a, again, the lakefront zone of wealth moving up to the lakeshore. And again, they found old landmarks waiting for them, among them the North Point Lighthouse. It goes back to 1855. And you think of these, these parks of having always been green and leafy. They weren't. They were farmland. They were just as denuded as any subdivision in the last 20 or 30 years. So they actually, as the park was developed and they planted trees, they actually had to lift this lighthouse off its foundation and more than double its height so the light would clear the trees as they grew. Lake Park itself was a major amenity for people coming up from the Lower East Side. And the streetcar company would have concerts there to try to draw settlement. And they would certainly bring people up from the heart of Milwaukee. Look, look at the size of these hats. These were strong necked women back, back in those years. And they kept on coming. Lake Drive became synonymous with wealth in Milwaukee. And this is one of the Eli mansions. That's the family who owned Schmidt's Brewing. Something really different was happening on the riverside as that vector kind of kept on moving up to the north. This is right around Locust Street on Milwaukee's east side. This is National Brake and Electric. They made locomotive brakes. And just behind it was the Northwestern Railroad that spewed coal smoke into the surrounding neighborhood. You know the neighborhood? This is right around where the Urban Ecology Center is and Milwaukee's east side. And the area became not quite as desperately poor as the Polish neighborhood had been, but kind of middle income to lower middle income. And you have kind of this, the area beginning to rise economically, but by no means anywhere close to what was going on along the lakefront. There were places where both the wealthy and the working class would meet. The Oriental Theater, going back to 1927, was one of them. But this is kind of the midpoint between the river and the lake settlement. And those contrasts are kind of baked into the landscape. To this day, along Kenwood Boulevard, which is the south border of UWM campus, there are 15 houses per block near the lake and 30 per block near the river. The average lot size near the river in the southwest corner is 30 feet. The average lot size in the northeast corner is 60 feet. So it's still part of the landscape of the east side of Milwaukee. In between the river and the lake, something quite different was happening. And this remained open. And part of the reason it remained open was it became a golf course back in 1894 when a group of well-heeled golfers began to play what they called pasture pool. 
and they laid out a primitive course in the cow pasture bordered roughly by Locust and Hartford between Downer and Oakland that basically is the UWM campus. So where the Union is, that was part of the first golf course in Milwaukee. And this was the origin of the Milwaukee Country Club that in 1911 moved out to River Hills in part because there was a lot of pressure being applied on kind of the back end. This was no longer the highest and best use for land that was so close to the edge of a developing city. And some of that pressure was supplied by educational institutions. You had Milwaukee Downer College, on Hartford and Downer that was a pioneer in women's education going back to 1899. And just a couple, not even a block south, was the State Teachers College, the State Normal School as it was called, opened back in 1909, and this is now Mitchell Hall, which is, plays the role of old name for the UWM campus. And on that campus in 1956, when Wisconsin developed really a sterling four-year university system, that was the nucleus of what became the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. The enrollment began at around 5,000 and very quickly ramped up to around 25,000. Ever since, the university has been a major influence on the east side's housing market, its culture, and its parking. <laughs> so that takes us to the limit of the east side, and development continued beyond Edgewood Avenue and to Shorewood. And to some degree, those contrasts remain still kind of a wealthier pattern on the lake and more working class, or at least more modest, on the river. Well, we'll go over to the west side, and that has in some ways the same kind of pattern as the east side as a large-scale district. And the east side, at least, there was a transition zone between the wealthy and the working class. On the west side, they virtually shared lot lines. So the contrasts there were a good deal sharper. And the first neighborhood west of downtown is Avenues West. And that has its roots back in the old Third Ward, south of downtown and east of the river. And that was the old Irish neighborhood, called the Bloody Third, it had the highest number of saloons in Milwaukee, the highest arrest rate. Not the place you would have brought your out-of-town guests to say this is the best Milwaukee has to offer. So some of the holes in the guys' overalls, rather a lower income neighborhood, but a strong sense of place as well. As they grew uh, in maturity and certainly in economic scale, a lot of them moved out. And where they moved largely was to the west side of downtown. Back in 1893, they established Jesu Church. That's now, sort of look at that as the campus church for Mark A. U. Uh, that was a Paris church for an Irish neighborhood called Torrey Hill. And that's still a place named the Lingers in the landscape. And only a few years later, in 1907, did Marquette University move to Grand Avenue. They had actually begun um, around where the courthouse is, the safety building is, if you know that part of Milwaukee, a kind of a hill rising from the Milwaukee River, which is why they were called the Hilltoppers. So they moved to Grand Avenue back in 1907, and you can see Jesu Church is on the right-hand side of this slide. They built Johnston Hall back in 1907, and that was the whole campus. That was all of Marquette for the first few years of this development. Right behind that church and Johnston Hall, you have working class housing, very heavily Irish, and some Eastern Europeans moved in as well. And they walked to work at jobs in the Menominee Valley, and the women might have worked as domestics in the mansions on Grand Avenue, and that's what was going on right across the street, basically, from Jay Zoo. Grand Avenue was known as Spring Street until 1876, when the name was changed to reflect the grand residences being built there. None grander than this one, which was the home of Alexander Mitchell. Mitchell Street, Mitchell Park, Mitchell Field is all the same family. And this was the home of a railroad tycoon, banker, insurance magnates, and this was back in 1876, the reason that the street's name was changed to Grand Avenue and set the tone for the development of Grand Avenue as kind of the west side's counterpart, the, the North Point wealth, uh, the Prospect Avenue wealth along the east side. It wasn't just Mitchell, you have the Plankentons who were in meatpacking. This is Mrs. Plankenton up for a ride, probably with an Irish driver. And here is the outside of her mansion, showing off her stock as well as her home. Here's the inside, the little Victorian fashion, Big stuff and lots of it. Like just chock a block, big furniture, big paintings, big chandeliers, kind of big things on the grand scale. 
And this was pretty typical uh, what it looked like for a generation around between roughly 1890 and 1914, World War One. The only one of those mansions that is open to all the rest of us today is the old Pax Mansion. It goes back to about 1893. The only reason that still stands is that it was for many years the residence of the Catholic Archbishop, but it had been torn down long before he had not hung around. So you have that, that zone of settlement along the Grand Avenue corridor, and the working class settlement kept on going as well south of Grand Avenue, and that remained just a razor sharp scene. As those working class families moved to the west, they settled a neighborhood called Merrill Park, west of 27th. Robert Market High School is north of the Menominee Valley. There was a Merrill, a Yankee named Sherbert S. Merrill, who was the general manager of the Milwaukee Road. He worked for Alexander Mitchell, who was president of the Milwaukee Road, and this was his house. By the time you get out to the Merrill Park area, these are largely small estates, kind of gentleman farms at the west end of Milwaukee back in the late 1800s. And just down the, the hill, you have the Menominee Valley being filled in back in, beginning back in 1869. And that former wild rice marsh that was critically important to Native Americans becomes by far the most valuable industrial real estate in all of Wisconsin. The Milwaukee Road Shops, where they made and repaired all the rolling stock for National Railroad, was one of the bigger employers there. And Merrill ran that, and Mitchell was above him. And there was such a close relationship between workers in Merrill Park and the railroad shops that there was actually a, a, a wooden walkway from the neighborhood down to the valley so they could get back, back and forth to work fairly easily. So if you have those jobs developing, providing the income for a neighborhood to develop, Merrill Park becomes a working class settlement of Irish, some German, and here it is on the process of being developed back around 1890. And as it was true for all the ethnic groups, the place of worship was the hub of the wheel, the center of lot around which things revolved. This is the St. Rose Church, founded back in 1888. And the roster of parish members there was like the Dublin Sulma. It was just unbelievably Irish. And as the movement continues to the west, you have another settlement called Pigsville, developing in the valley. How many of you have been to Pigsville? A few of you. That's, that's kind of a Wisconsin literacy test. <laughs> it's a unique settlement and is down in the Nami Valley, just within a stone's throw of Miller Park. And this is actually a picture of it as it developed. This was Blue Mound Road when it was the main traveled road out of Milwaukee and just a dirt trail going down to the Nami River there. It's just a bridge in the middle distance. And this was kind of the main travel road out, but it also provided access for a neighborhood that was on the east bank of the Menominee River as a farm specializing in pigs was still in business on the west bank. So the pig farm thing kind of gets transposed to the east side. Pigs Town appeared in print back in around uh, 1894. That gets changed to Pigsville. And in time, back in 1911, they built the Grand Avenue Viaduct over the Menominee River, and that kind of put a roof over Pigsville and allowed us to develop in peace and quiet. It is the most isolated neighborhood in Milwaukee. There are fewer than 300 households, there are 11 streets, and seven end in dead ends. So you don't get there unless you're lost or you live there. <laughs> a unique urban village in Milwaukee. And it bore the brunt of uh, regular flooding from the Menominee River time they got around in rowboats rather than cars, and that's been taken care of by the sewer district just in the last 10 years or so. And it was ethnic but not Irish, largely Eastern European, especially Slovak. Uh, there were some Poles, some Serbs, some Slovenians, but there were especially Slovaks there, and there were still families of Slovakian heritage who traced their roots back to the 1880s. So you follow that working class settlement, Torrey Hill, Merrill Park, Pigsville, you go on to West Dallas, that was the biggest industrial suburb in Wisconsin. Built around Dallas Chalmers, which at one time had a workforce of 20,000 people. The wealthy zone worked, continued to work west as well. You have the Concordia neighborhood developing and the area kind of north of Wisconsin Avenue, west of 27th. 
named after a German Lutheran college that was pretty much a center of German-speaking farm boys who wanted to be ministers. So it was very much the, uh, they didn't, they didn't stop German until uh, World War I or so. All from the Midwest, and here they are kind of blowing off steam in a pillow fight. So they are pretty much uh, people of challenging, challenging economic circumstances. And that college was surrounded by the homes of some wealthy Germans moving from farther east along Grand Avenue. And Highland Boulevard, well, just before it had trees, becomes among the most prestigious sections of Milwaukee. And one of the mansions still there is the Paps Mansion. Frederick Paps the father, built on 20th in Wisconsin. Frederick Paps the son, built on 30, about 30th in Highland. And on the right-hand side there is Gustav Paps home. That's where he moved from, to the North Point section of the Milwaukee's east side. Just look at the carriage houses behind these homes. Masonry, uh, more substantial than most single-family homes in the surrounding neighborhoods. So this highland was so loaded with wealthy Germans that at one time it was called Sauerkraut Boulevard. But it was not just Germans. You had Dan Holm, Milwaukee's socialist mayor from 1916 to 1940, lived there for his entire term, always outvoted and described him as a socialist Daniel and a den of Republicans. <laughs> Did not get along politically with his neighbors. And that zone of wealth keeps on moving to the north and west. Washington Heights, west of Washington Park, becomes a zone of middle to upper middle income families. Washington Boulevard is the main drag. And the big landmark there was St. Sebastian's Catholic Church. And the scale of that church kind of indicates what's going on in the surrounding neighborhood. Still a focal point for Catholics in that section of Milwaukee. And to keep on going north and west, you have Sherman Park. Uh, developing in the years between roughly 1910 and 1930 as a commuter suburb, basically, even though it's a neighborhood. And this is a post zoning neighborhood. 1920 is when Milwaukee adopted the zoning ordinance. So, setbacks, spaces between houses, neat and tidy compared to what had been the case in the older sections of Milwaukee or most American cities. So, you keep on following that zone west and you follow the zone of pretty comfortable people up to 51st Boulevard, Sherman Park, and on into Wauwatosa, Elm Grove, Brookfield. And people in the town of Brookfield out there in those big mansions probably don't think about it very often, but they can trace the character of their settlement in one unbroken line all the way back to 9th of Wisconsin, where the Mitchell Mansion still stands, now as the Wisconsin Club. So again, history is why things are the way they are. Just two more districts, talk about the north side. And the north and south sides are alike in that they have, the big patterns there are that they have tended to be large areas of unresisting geography that were settled by one large group after another. And kind of this, as the sequent occupants, residential succession model that you read about for studying back in geography school, certainly plays up very obviously in the north side. The oldest neighbor on the north side is Brewers Hill, the area just north of the Schlitz Brewery. Schlitz moved there back in 1870 and became the beer that made Milwaukee famous, but was smaller than half until the years after 1900. And you have, as that area becomes very heavily German, very heavily working class, you have Third Street, now King Drive, becomes the commercial corridor, the downtown for that section of Milwaukee. Schuster's was the place to shop and you don't hear it anymore except as a parody. But the old Germanic sort of uh, influence speech need be done by Schuster's, or the streetcar events the corner around. So that this was among them. This building still stands as well. It was also a place for recreation. The Path Brewery had its own park on Burleigh and King Drive, 3rd Street. One of the attractions was an amusement ride called Kassenjammer Castle behind the, the beer garden here. The north side was also the center of professional baseball in Milwaukee. And the real landmark there was Orchard Field. If you've ever taken I-43 north of Milwaukee, you're going right through the ghost of Orchard Field. That's right around Burleigh. And that was built back in 1888 and was the home of the minor league Milwaukee Brewers from 1902 to 1952. 50 years. And 53, the Braves come from Boston. This was obsolete. So they tore it down, made it a playground, and then put the freeway right through it. 
So if you look at the power alleys here, a pull header, it's, it's, it's a square block. I'm going to show it into a single city block, so a pull header can pretty easily put a wall through a dining room window across the street, which happens with some regularity. One of the hazards of being across from Orchard Field. So the area kept on growing to the north and west. Uh, corridors like Green Bay, Zaytonia, Appleton kind of move up the procession out like the conveyor belt. And this is what housing construction looked like back around the turn of the 20th century. And that gave rise to neighborhoods that we know them today as places like Lindsay Heights and the modern Metcalf Park. And as that, that succession continues in the heart of the north side, the Germans keep on moving out, and the next large group in was Eastern European Jews who began to arrive back in the 1880s, and this was their neighborhood back in around uh, 19, 1900 or so. This is pre-zoning in Milwaukee, pre-zoning America. It was like to take a dice box of land uses and sort of shuffle them out, and sort of cast them out in the landscape. And among the people who moved in that period was a young woman on the far right side of this, this photograph. Her name was Golda Mabouez, and she was a valedictorian of the class of 4th Street School back in 1912. And that school is now named for her, and her later name, Golda Meir. So probably Milwaukee's most famous ex-resident. The Jewish, Jewish families kept on moving north and west, and along Titonia Avenue, established their own places of worship. Like Beth Israel, a uh, classic synagogue, and still there, but this is now the home of Greater Galilee Baptist Church. So you have succession going on in terms of the institutions as well. <coughs> because you move from the Germans to the Eastern European Jews and to African Americans who begin to arrive on the north side back in the teens and 20s. They've been in Milwaukee since before the Civil War, but it was during that first great migration, the first wave, 1910 to 1930, that so many rural southerners, sharecroppers, become urban industrial workers in the north and Milwaukee got its share of that migration. And like all groups, formed their own institutions, uh, but in many cases that was reinforced by the fact that they were not welcome and the predominantly white institutions, had their own places of worship, like St. Mark's African Methodist Church, had their own athletic leagues, this is not the Negro League, but the homegrown leagues, this is the Urban League team, they go back to around 1919, had their own social service institutions, and the high Y, the YMCA on North Avenue, which you can see in the attic of a 19th century home, and had their own businesses as well. Uh, Bronzeville, the heart of that commercial district, was around Walnut and Third Streets, and just a, a robust commercial establishment. And for them and for many of the other groups that settled on Milwaukee's north side, the attraction was jobs, and that kept pulling them to the north and west. This is the A.O. Smith plant up around 27th and Capitol. At one time, this had 9,000 workers and was the largest manufacturer of car and truck frames in the entire world. By the years after World War II, they are integrated. And this was the beginning of African Americans moving into the middle class, family supporting jobs, being able to send their kids to school, you know, buy a house, buy a car. And what happened was the recession of the 1980s really savaged manufacturing in Milwaukee and elsewhere. So A.O. Smith became tower and then closed. There are no jobs in the old plant. Let's say it's resurrecting it as Century City, trying to re-industrialize that old complex. So if you wonder why there is such entrenched poverty in the inner city, deindustrialization was a long way for explaining it both in Milwaukee and other U.S. cities. But it is not the entire story. There is a black middle class growing as well, most visibly in neighborhoods like Halyard Park on the near north side, which is by law open to everyone, but happens to be a haven for Milwaukee's black middle class. And the success story is suburban in everything but address. And that pattern is playing out in other sections of Milwaukee's north side as well. The last side we'll visit is the south side. And if you were to do the story of the south side, you'd say, in the beginning was the valley. The book of Genesis would talk about the Menominee Valley as both a half mile wide barrier between the south side and the rest of the world. And it was it took a long time to be filled in. This is a shot from back in 1886. It's already industrializing, but you can see it still says shallow water. So, it took a long time for that to uh, become made land, which was the term they used back in those days. 
The south side took shape as a complex of neighborhoods, and the oldest is Walker's Point, which is by definition the oldest neighborhood in Milwaukee. And there actually was a point. It's a wonderful map, the register of these. It shows where that peninsula was, uh, maybe 69, three blocks long, and was quickly erased to fill in all the swamp land that was so abundant in the heart of Milwaukee. And that became, because of tidal problems, because of Walker's lack of aggressiveness, became not so much a residential center as an industrial center. Back in 1867, a man named Edward P. Alice, the forerunner of Alice Chalmers, puts a plant down there in first in Florida, and he becomes the world's largest manufacturer of steam engines. Look at the size of this thing. So this was back in the 1890s, 1880s, 1890s. This was before late laser machinery, or CNC uh, numerically controlled machines. So they really had skill, and they became among the largest uh, manufacturers of heavy equipment in the entire world. And other companies ranging from Curly and Trekker to Chamdall to Allen Bradley, the plant was shown here, made this the industrial heartland of Milwaukee. And Walker's Point, the neighborhood, developed as kind of a polyglot, very multi-ethnic village of industrial workers. So it was diverse north of Greenfield Avenue, but to the south, you have, again, these large groups. And the first one through was Poles, began to arrive back in the 1860s. And they were typically people of large families, multi-generational Polish family, like mine and Bob's back in the turn of the 20th century. And they were heavily Catholic, and Mitchell Street was the home of St. Stanislaus Church, which was the first Polish church in any American city, beat Chicago by one year. And it was the mother church of more than 20 congregations around town, among them St. Joseph Fox Basilica, which was the closest thing Wisconsin has to a genuine European cathedral. And this was built with material established from the Chicago Post Office. This is a green building. This would be Lee Platinum, had there been such a thing when it was done back in 1901. So the rule of thumb on the south side is that you have big churches and small houses. And the contrast is extreme, but the same people built both of them. And it really underlines how important the place of worship was for the immigrant ancestors. So you have these small homes on 25 or 30 foot wide lots. But they were poor, but because they had such numbers, they could support large commercial institutions. Uh, among the, the heartland there, part of the heartland there was Mitchell Street, which was the south side of downtown. I grew up on Milwaukee South Side, recall people saying I'm going downtown. They did not mean Wisconsin Avenue, they meant Mitchell Street. Well, that was the south side of downtown where a lot of shopping was, just as Third Street was for the German North Side. And in time, this became, developed a landscape for kind of like a, a water town or a marinette, kind of a small city inside the larger city. There was also commerce on the side streets, among them uh, our, our grandfather's hardware store on 32nd and Lincoln, stood there from 1915 to 1965. So this is the original John Gerda in Milwaukee. So the Poles kept on moving south and west, and by the 1920s, the next big move through is Latinos. And they are largely from Mexico itself, some from border towns. And early on, the Lusty Meadows, the pioneers, these were largely guys. These were men who were offered jobs in the tanneries, especially, a free passage north. And they settled on the south side in the area around the tannery, which is why the area today, Walker's Point, has the largest Spanish speaking population in the entire state. And by definition, the greatest number of good Mexican restaurants as well. Stand on 6th and Ashton, you can hardly throw a stone and miss a good, a good restaurant. So guys at first, and then women become, begin to arrive. They had their own social clubs, their own newspaper. And back in 1926, they opened the Mission of Our Lady of Guadalupe in a former blacksmith shop on 5th Street. That church later moved to an old telephone exchange on 3rd, and now it's a Guadalupe Center for young children. And Walker's Point remains quite diverse, but the Latino population there certainly has a dominant role to play. So the neighborhood, the district keeps on moving to the south and the west. Neighborhoods like Layton Park and Jackson Park keeps on moving south and east. Neighborhoods like Bayview, an old industrial suburb, and Tippecanoe. And that, in a nutshell, is the story of grassroots Milwaukee. It is a story of how earlier Milwaukeeans settled in different parts of town and created dozens of different neighborhoods. 
and yet we're part of the life of the community as a whole. Neighborhoods can be a cartographer's nightmare, but they are a cultural geographer's dream because it is on the neighborhood level that you see most clearly the unity and diversity that is such an important part of urban life. And you see the historical patterns that shape who we are as a community today. So Milwaukee is indeed a city of neighborhoods. I encourage you to discover its abundant riches for yourselves. Thank you.